Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. Um, this is, uh, what is it? It's October 15th, 2014, and we, um, as I said in my blurb about this last night, um, we didn't get enough last month, so we asked Jeremy Dean to come back, and um, I followed some of his lead, uh, pointing to some educators in an email recently who are doing interesting work on genius, and there was such a a gracious, lovely, um, almost everybody said yes who I asked. So welcome. Nicely. All you, <laughs> yes. So welcome all you geniuses <laughs> here tonight. Um, and so we need to do a quick round of um, introductions. Um, I'll say that uh, you know I I'm a teacher at uh, you know model this I hope I'm a teacher at. Uh, uh, middle school, uh, hopefully will become a secondary school um, in the Bronx called New Directions and uh, my kids have been messing around on Genius for a few weeks now um, and that's where I am. Jeremy, do you want to introduce yourself next? Uh, yeah, uh, my name is Jeremy Dean, I'm the Director of Education at uh, Genius.com and just so humbled uh, to be invited back by Paul, but uh, even more humbled that all these folks uh, who I did not know Paul invited uh, <laughs> to join the conversation uh, showed up. I mean, I, I've talked to some of you guys on the phone, and it's just it's, it's really uh, a wonderful thing to see you guys here, and I, I'm so excited to have a conversation. Yeah, I mean, we want to really get into the sort of a little bit into the technology of Genius, but it's um, so interesting to see the community developing as well, right? And you seem to be a big part of that. Oh, it's, it's remarkable. I mean, I really am just kind of floored yeah, that everybody's yeah. here. Uh, it's, it's a special thing, and I, I feel like a surprise party. I feel like it's a surprise party, um, actually. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, we, can, we can whip out party hats in the Google yeah. Plus. I don't know if I remember how to do that. Okay, there we go. <laughs> go ahead, if you are. So, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Elisa, keep talking. <laughs> okay. Introduce yourself. Um, the last time I did a Google Hangout, um, we actually did use car party, the party hats because it was sort of new to us. But um, <laughs> Right, I'm a professor of English at Pitt Greensburg, uh, or University of Pittsburgh in Greensburg. I'm down in um, Southwest PA. Um, and I work with my 19th century Brit Lit students in Genius. I'm um, increasingly thinking about using it in other courses. I'm starting to get really used to it this fall. It's my second year in here, um, and I, I'm enjoying it a lot. Um, last year I was maybe a little hesitant about some aspects of it, and this year I feel very differently, and, and I don't know, It's um, I like it a lot. I think I, I had it take, took some getting used to, um, but I'm enjoying. There's a whole, whole lot of things we can do in here um, that seem like they're full of potential. And yeah, I guess I'll stop there and <laughs> wait for that to unfold in conversation. Provocative introduction. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. If you sure. like, I'll just keep going on and on like that. <laughs> okay. So and and by the way, this is not an interview. This is a this is a conversation. Please interrupt. Okay. Carrie, Carrie, go ahead. Introduce yourself. Um, I've been. Well, I discovered Genius quite by accident, um, and uh, my students are addicted to it. Um, they, they, you, we're using it on all the time. I, I teach a rhetoric class, and um, it's all they want to do, like every day. They come yeah. in. Let's use real, let's use Genius. Um, and what we're doing right now is using it for rhetorical analysis, um, looking at devices that are being used um, by different writers. I've been posting articles and have them um, go in and. Uh, we learned. I learned very quickly that if I just turn them loose, they go crazy, and so now we're you know okay. Limit yourself to these things, and uh, now they're actually responding to each other online, and um, they, it's just fantastic to watch the development of their interactive reading skills right there on the screen. That's and, uh, what I like you know, about it too. And yeah. the, the IQ points have them completely like. Huh. The, one of them called it the IQ land grab and. They're, they have a huh. contest going on to see who can get the most points. So the, the, the gamification has sort of got them interested, and now they're doing stuff without even really realizing that, that that's what's really going on. And Carrie, where do you teach? Uh, I teach at Pembroke Academy in New Hampshire. What, and, what age? Uh, what age? Uh, 9 through 12. 
And the kids that I have using Genius right now are my, my 11th graders, but I just started a, a foray into it with my freshmen, but we have a population with our freshmen this year, a lot of kids that are extremely technologically uh, naive, hmm. large, largely due to lack of resources. So what, having what used, state again are you in? New so, Hampshire. New Hampshire, got it. Great. So, Just uh, anyway, quick thing to do. Great. I can't wait to hear more. Chris Sloan, do you want to say hello? <laughs> yeah, my name is Chris Sloan, and I teach high school English and media at Judge Memorial in Salt Lake City, Utah. And, um, you know, I'm an interloper here. I actually have been looking at Genius, um, but um, I haven't actually used it in my class, but, you know, I definitely. I mean, I know the value of annotation and, you know, increasingly looking at social annotation. So um, I'm interested in just kind of getting involved and seeing what everyone, um, how people use it. Chris, Chris and I have been working on building a community and a website called Youth Voices on it for the last 11 years. So that's one of the ways we connect. So we're looking for other ways. And so, yep. Um, very cool. So we have a few other people to introduce Eric, Greg, and Jasmine. Eric. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric. I teach English at Boston College. This is my this is my first semester there, and I just got finished using Genius to teach Chaucer. I'm a medievalist, and I had my students annotate some of the Chaucer texts, uh, and they were some of the first ones to do so. So that was exciting. I had them do it do it publicly. So looking forward to chatting about Genius. That sounds exciting. I've been watching the Chaucer, by the way. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, just a little bit, you know, off the periphery. I'm over in the 19th century, but yeah, right. it was nice medieval activity going on. Yeah. Cool. Jasmine, quickly. And Greg, I'm sorry, we skipped you, but go ahead. Whoever wants to jump in, go ahead. <laughs> so, um, I'm Jasmine Mulliken. I'm a visiting assistant professor at Oklahoma State University. And uh, I know Jeremy, actually, from UT. We went to UT together. Um, so I've been using Genius um, in, well, I've been using it in my Intro to Literature class. And um, I've been doing that for about three semesters now. And then I just started using it in my composition class to do some rhetorical analysis um, for primary sources that my students are uh, are finding for their research papers in Comp 2. So that's kind of my experience with it so far. Thank you for joining us. Greg. Um, my name is Greg McVeary. I'm a literacy and technology professor at uh, Southern Connecticut State University. Um, I started playing around with Genius as part of a poetry project called Walk My World, um, where we were, you know, we were really exploring um, poets in depth and used Genius through them all up in there. And late this semester I've been using them more for um, informational texts. Putting them up there, but also having fun, like doing things like um, you can only reply with like response uh, with response gifts, or um, mm -hmm. you know, and just trying to. I love the image in the the movie making, so I've been trying to add an additional layer of, of making on top of annotation, just just for fun. Um, but then at other times, letting the kids just annotate articles and myself um, to really explore and play. Cool, Richard. Welcome. Thank you. We're introducing ourselves, where, where we teach, who we, who we teach, and your experience with Genius so far. Okay, I just started it. I am a high school teacher in uh, suburban Michigan. I'm just outside of Detroit. Um, I started it about, I don't know, a week ago because a, another colleague of mine who I team teach with, well, we hook our classes up. She's from South Dakota. I don't even know if she's here. And she said, let's do Macbeth together. So she put up the dagger, you know, the, uh, is this a dagger I see before me? And then we let our students go, you know, kind of have at it. And I was really excited with two things. Number one, the fun that they had with it. And number two, the way they talked about it and the way that they said it kind of liberated their voices and just a lot of things about audience that I hadn't been thinking of. So... Really fascinated at this point, and mostly just looking to learn as much as possible and see if I can't. Okay, I'm going to be honest. Steal all your ideas, and then you know, yeah. <laughs> I'm a little bit. Well, welcome. And Jennifer, are you there? Yeah, I think so. Oh, you okay? Good. Sorry, and I'm not sure how long I can stay, but I was really interested in the conversation. 
Um, I'm at Georgetown University. I teach in an intensive English as a foreign language program. And I played with um, Rap Genius, as it was called, about a year ago uh, with some grammar students. And then I kind of didn't do anything with it. And now I've started using it about a week ago uh, with my reading and writing students, trying to get them to develop actually their annotation and close reading skills. Um, so I had them in the lab a couple days ago, and we'll probably have them in the lab again tomorrow with it. What, what age are your students? Uh, they're, they're mostly, let's say, mid, 20, mid to late 20s. Okay. They're international students who uh, want to go to university in the U.S. and are working on their English skills to do that. And where are you? Georgetown University in Washington, okay. D.C. Got it. Okay. I was listening, but I missed it. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Stay as long as you like. So, Jeremy, can you um, uh, organize this a little bit? Uh, at least tell us what um, <laughs> what this thing is that used to be Rap Genius and and and, and is obviously exploding into Education Genius. <laughs> oh, look! I mean, uh, this is. I I really want to listen as much as possible tonight. It's so amazing to see so many people who I've corresponded with in various formats. Jennifer, I owe you an email. I'm sorry. It's, it's good to have you join us, though. Um, and uh, I mean, it really is just I'm 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 kind of humbled I, again, as I said, by by the turnout here. And I really hear other people conversing about their experiences because there's such a diversity of uh, institutions, uh, kinds of classes. I'm sure teaching approaches represented on the on the people on the line here. And really, much more interesting would be to hear how they've been using it. Um, and they're all. Everybody I'm looking at uh, is a veteran, uh, you know, user of Genius. Um, even people like Eric uh, started this term, and Carrie are doing, you know, throw body with their with their classes uh, on the site. But uh, if, if there is anybody listening that's not here or for posterity, I'll just say that uh, very quickly that Genius started off as Rap Genius. It was a lyric platform that had annotation functionality. Um, and blew up. a lot of people were excited to annotate uh, lyrics, and they built a number of social uh, networking tools, but also uh, kind of Wikipedia-like uh, wiki tools for collaborative knowledge uh, production. Um, and I discovered it as a high school English teacher after, as I was finishing my PhD, uh, as a hip hop fan. But immediately recognized what each of you have recognized in your own ways. <laughs> that what a cool tool for the classroom um, to teach this, you know, traditional learning skill of annotation, but in a new way, uh, as I think uh, maybe Chris mentioned about social annotation, taking this traditional learning strategy of writing the margins of text and putting it online, making it social, uh, making it uh, multimedia. Um, and uh, after I experimented in my classroom, the company said, "This, you're right, this is a good idea. Why don't you come work for us? And uh, why don't you get 12 people from across the ro uh, country teaching at different levels uh, using the site in the classroom? And it uh, looks like tonight I've, I've accomplished it that much at least. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so uh, yes. it's super exciting to see all you guys. And I, I really look forward to hearing you guys talk about your experiences and, and sharing your projects. So um, let's stay on the tip of, uh, how, I'll make it a joke, um, one of my students who, was, who always used to sneak rap genius right in the background whenever we were doing other assignments, you know, is convinced that I've ruined it um, by bringing it into the classroom. Um, but, so how do we, so let me, so let me pose it that way, how do we not ruin rap genius and by bringing it into the classroom and, and or, how do, I, you, can, you can say that more generously, um, like how do we take the power of this um, popular social tool and use it in our classrooms? Does that, anyone want to kind of look at that question? Elisa, you were going to, you were saying something about that, right? <laughs> Well, okay, I had a student who uh, excitedly came to me in like maybe the second week of the course and said, hey, did you see this poem we're reading? It's on this really cool site called Lit Genius, and there's this, and he's showing it to me, and I said, yeah, 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 we're going in there next week, you know, <laughs> sort of a, um, so there was some excitement already about this and I think some of my students have played around and like they've heard of Rap Genius before before I ever showed this to them. Yeah, the idea that we're taking the fun out of it, 
I don't know. Um, it's it's better. It's a middle schooler who said it. It's okay, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know, middle opinions only go so far, right? I don't know, but I I feel as if. I feel a little strange about what I'm doing because I took out a traditional poetry explication assignment I that was sort of just a long paper where a student is kind of walking slowly through a poem and you can read it by the hand through it. I had that paper assignment last year that accompanied my Lit Genius annotations. This fall, I decided to say, screw it. I don't even want to read that paper. I want to read all of it. <laughs> on genius. I want you guys to write the historical wow. content. And there's a part of me that feels like, oh no, am I slipping? You know, am I slipping in the quality control? What's happening to the traditional paper? Has this become too fun? I think I'm a little more confident this year that actually it's fine, that I think my students are, are saying better things in that form than they were in the paper size. Now, actually, I'm not saying no more papers, because they are, they are going to have a research wow. paper doing the end of term, but poetry analysis, I think maybe this is a better way to do it. Um, yeah. I completely agree with that. Um, I, I've i been using uh, Genius in my intro to Lit, like I said, with um, we, we cover the, the genres of uh, fiction, poetry, and drama, and I've, I've implemented a, an, an annotation assignment in um, all three of those, but with the poetry unit, it's just especially I get especially good results with that because it 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 ensures that they're looking that the students are looking at each individual line and just individual phrases and individual words, and they're really paying attention to that word level mm -hmm. analysis that is so important in poetry, and they're deriving maybe larger thematic arguments from specific phrases or specific word choice, which is so much about poetry analysis. That's what poetry analysis is. And so it really engages, it It lets them engage with the poetry more closely than they do, I think, with the longer traditional essays, where they're starting with a thematic idea and trying to find lines that connect to it. When they start with genius, they're looking at the lines first and then deriving the themes from from the from the specific phrases and the specific lines. And I, I think it just really helps them to see how the how that word choice and the smaller micro levels of language work in poetry. And it's really I, I love I love using the, the genius assignment in in the poetry unit especially. What, can I ask what aspect of, of both of you for your assignments uh, do you pull in the social element of um, of rap genius or genius? Okay. Like, are students cooperatively uh, annotating the poem, or are they oh. each annotating their own and then sharing okay. it in some way? Yes, yeah, some of each. Um, Right. This was one of the things I had a little trouble wrapping my head around last year, and I'm a lot more used to it now. Um, I have a, fir a, a first couple of assignments that aren't worth a huge amount, just to kind of get the students in. I feel like I'm throwing them in the pond, go swimming around, go figure out what's in here, which are a lot more collaborative. Um, I have one where I've thrown them into the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner twice now and had them run around building annotations. They're all awfully repetitive. Some of them are really terrible. I should really go in and mop those up. Um, but to get them started, I do like having multiple students in a big poem. Um, as we move on, I, try, I look for some poems that are maybe a little more sparsely annotated, which is sometimes a bit of a challenge. Um, the current assignment my students are working on, are, it's kind of the large poetry assignment project for the term. And they're supposed to take leadership of a poem, which isn't to say that they're the only one, only voice speaking on a poem, but that they're going to be coming in, um, having done some research, some distinctive information about the poem. They're assigned to write the historical context note, which most annotators really run away from. Um, and the idea is, uh, and I, I even have maybe two or three students working on very long narrative poems and then they have some options to sort of just take on a poem by themselves. Uh, but it sort of took me a while to figure out um, 
kind of to come up with some good expectations for them so that it would be um, challenging enough because the social dynamic of it could be, all right, we go find some cute things to say. Um, every time there's a sunset, let's go grab an image of a sunset and pop it in the poem. Okay, yeah, that only goes that only goes so far. Quality, uh, the quality of the annotations has been something that I've been trying to enforce, which... Um, I'm I'm still working on that, but yeah, some of the students are simply better at this than others, I guess. Um, maybe a kind of rambly response to your question, but yeah, cool. uh, could somebody explain that? Uh, maybe Jeremy or anybody, but the the private the private public um, distinction that you can create a, a private yeah. uh, version for your class. Yeah, I use that. Working in public, and how do you guys? How do different yeah. people handle that? First of all, explain the the possibility there. Maybe. Well, if there's a there's a public page which anybody can annotate on, and then there's you can make a private class page of a similar of the same text, and then you can add your own ideas or change the text if you want to. And the private page, when someone goes to it, it has a message at the top that says this is a private page for you know for my case is Carrie Thompson's class, and then it basically you know if you want to comment on it and you're not part of the class, then go comment on the public page. Um, but people can still see right. it publicly, is that right? Is that right? Well, I'm, I'm wondering. The way it works... Uh, Go ahead, Jeremy. Yeah. So the way it works is that the private pages the, the private pages are removed from search on the site, search, you know, within Google, so they're not indexed. Um, so they're very, very hard to discover. Um, but there are, are a few, you know, ways, like, say, you know, my student is annotating my private version of Gatsby, but then they annotate uh, the Beatles in public. You could potentially, because anybody with, with that link can access the page. So the note of speaking uh, that says, you know, if this is not your class, you know, go to the public page is to ward off anybody that, because it's not truly private in the sense that, you know, you have a special login as anybody who's used them will know. Um, it's really like creating a YouTube and then anybody with the URL uh, can view the video. Um, <clears throat> that's how that works. Uh, but I just want to emphasize said about starting off collaborative um, and moving to the individual projects. Actually, I think Alicia had it, you know, spot on her first try last term, uh, last spring when she did the site. Last uh, month. Starting off collaboratively, getting the kids used to the used to the site, uh, working together, um, learning from each other, learning the site, but then making them individually responsible for. Or her the, her uh, adopt a poem assignment previously, but I found it to be an incredibly powerful assignment because it forced the students to have a kind of editorial responsibility for the the thing as a whole. Uh, really become their own kind of Norton anthology of literature editor uh, because as as they they write the head note and they're responsible for any historical context or any literary device or anything that might need explaining in the poem. I think it is a probably a college level assignment maybe or a higher, you know, a, a certainly an assignment for later in a semester in a high school English class uh, depending on the level of the kids but uh, I, I think it was a great, uh, it's one that I share all the time <laughs> uh, as a model. Um, this adopt a poem assignment that she has, and she's doing it again. <laughs> well, it was actually Jeremy's idea when you introduced me to the site. I think that was. Yeah. So I just ran. Um, but oh, just hearing I'm glad you guys. You take that go ahead, Greg. Go ahead. Yeah. Just hearing you guys think about that, I was going well. You know, because a lot of my students will teach middle school or elementary. It's how do we adopt this? And I go back to everything that's wrong with literature circles, with these kids just filling out these worksheets and these roles. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, well, what if in a piece of literature you gave them, you know, annotation rules? Like, I, your job is to just focus in on any kind of connotative language, but your job is to, you know, I want you to summarize, and I've been fooling around with this idea of using the sidebar. There's like a little side um, notation part of outlining there. Right. Um, and signing these different roles within the, the whole text that we can take we can really adapt what we do in literature discussions already, um, and knowing that annotation only works when people are reading with a purpose in mind, that we can just kind of assign these roles. So I'm totally stealing that idea. The one thing thing I talking about your comments. Whoop, yeah, sure, go ahead. Sorry, one thing I'll, I also pick up is um, 
Well, the, in terms of keeping it fun is the importance of having a, an authentic audience and having a sense of ownership. And I'm, think, I'm kind of thinking through this as, as you're talking, you know, especially also with the roles. When I took my students in, I was a little surprised at their reaction. It was a more difficult text message from Wall Street, um, reading from Huffington Post, difficult for my students, uh, partly for the subject matter. And they'd already read it and took taken their own notes and had trouble with it. So I kind of used that as the, the basis. Well, maybe if we all put our heads together, we can figure out this text. And so then went into the lab and, and they worked on it. We didn't really have enough time, unfortunately, but I asked them afterward what they thought and they, they didn't react very positively. They said they prefer to discuss it in the classroom Ooh. versus trying to work it out in this way. And mentions this morning and realized, not surprisingly really for my students, almost all of them were vocabulary, defining vocabulary. And so I was also thinking about this idea of, of looking at the text through different lenses. Um, but I hadn't thought of assigning different roles. So, you know, one buddy, somebody has an inference. Or maybe it's that they each have a paragraph and they have, you know, the vocabulary annotations and the inference annotations and the tone annotations and whatever. Well, what I found interesting, the Student's Guide to Genius, um, I thought that was pretty well written because it actually discourages people from simply doing the micro focus on just one word and giving a definition. There is the sense that, okay, you want to take a broader view or you want to you want to be speaking to people about this or um, I, I had thought the Student's Guide to Genius was a way of I mean, if you give that to your students first, maybe a way of sort of um, directing them stylistically to try um, try different things. I'm babbling here, but I mean, but I I know what you mean about the student going in and providing what's really a very dull kind of annotation, right? That you've got to sort of get them to be maybe more real about what they're saying. Um, one of the things that I, I did with my kids when we first started, the first one we did, they just went to town and we ended up with everything in the article was, I mean, literally from beginning to end had a highlight on it. Like, maybe that's not quite what you guys want to do. So then we went and looked at different pages and I had them go through different, you know, just randomly selecting text. What do you notice about these annotations? What do you like about them? And we made a list of what made a good annotation. It's informative. It makes you think versus what makes a not so great annotation. It's a picture that just somebody put in there, obviously, because they thought it was fun, which is okay, but is it moving the conversation along? And uh, and that really helped a lot with um, having them understand um, what what true effective annotation is like. Um, and then the second time we did an article, their annotations were much better. And then I started having them you know, you have now you have to respond to four of your classmates and that kind of thing. I have a problem, you know, just IT wise with uh, uh, public pages versus private pages. Mm. I have to make all of my stuff private right now because our IT director has a problem with, you know, that's a personal thing. But in any case, um, it's an all thing. Yeah, well, <laughs> um, but they're they're really moving the conversation along, and we're doing a lot of nonfiction because it's a rhetoric class. It's really about the writing. And so as I'm telling them, you know, we're going to look at this article for this, you know, classification or something like that, um, and I tell them to go through and look for the examples of that and, and then explain in the annotation how they're effective. But I was going to say, I had my kids, um, I, I asked them all a question, what are your, you know, give me three sentences of what you like about using Genius. And I have this great PDF file of all of their fun comments about what they like about the site. and. Um, and in fact, I sent it to um, Liz, which is who's one of the people that works with, with Genius, and um, it was just really you, interesting. Can to you see tell us comments. some of them just now? Though? Um, yeah, uh, let's see. Um, I like how the Genius is an alternative to the class discussion. Reading other people's comments can help to clarify and give ideas. I think the fact it's interactive encourages more students to participate. Three or four of them really like the IQ points. Again, it has that element of gamification, which these kids really just eat that up. But I told them that I wouldn't give them IQ points unless they had a really good annotation. Mm -hmm. um, so they have the ones on the site, and then they have Mrs. Thompson's IQ points. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, I like that we're able to see everyone else's annotations to bounce ideas off everybody. Um, it's helpful in understanding the different aspects of the reading and the writing. 
Um, uh, I really enjoy comparing my thoughts with those of my classmates and seeing through the different perspectives of my peers. It's interesting to see what our teacher and peers have to say in response to our annotations too. So, um, you know, their the their comments were were really interesting, and I, I actually used them to sort of I'm trying to advocate for some training um, and to share it with my colleagues to say, you know, hey, you guys really need to try this. And so now I have little students who are going out to their other teachers and saying, hey, let's use this site because it's really awesome. Mm -hmm. So one of the history teachers is actually getting into the history social studies portion of it. So it, it you know, um, but my students really do love it and they find it very effective and in terms of pushing their conversation along. Sometimes they're more willing to type something they're not willing to say in class. I wanted I wanted to go back to that phrase and you just said it again. Um, that you, so you talk to your students about annotation being a conversation about the text. Is that that so mm -hmm. that that's a, an ongoing conversation? Yes. Do, can you say a little more of what you mean by that? Well, we're like I said, we're it's a writing class that I'm teaching right now. Um, next semester we move into it's a lit class. So our you know, we're divided into two, basically two half-year courses. And um, so we're looking at the writing and what constitutes quality writing and then different specific aspects of writing and that they can then imitate in terms of their own writing. And one of the things that we've talked about is that, you know, in order to understand writing to, to write well, you have to understand what it is and then you have to be able to identify what's good about it and that kind of thing. So um, it's just the way that they see genius, it's an ongoing sort of interactive, they can talk about it anytime, they post their comments, people give their comments back, and then we come into class and we just sort of touch base on it, well, you know, hey, what did you, on this article that we just did, um, what was the most insightful thing that someone said to you, and why was that so insightful, and how could you apply what they said or what they did in your own essay that we're working on now, um, and so it's really tying it together. And they're, I find they're much more willing to say things on Genius than they are to share it in class. I don't know if it's because they need to process more or if it's just that they, there's that layer of slight anonymity of, of posting something instead of saying it in class where they might be, you know, they, I think in some ways they feel more comfortable um, sharing their thoughts on Genius than they do necessarily in class. Um, I'm going to, can I interject here for a second? Um, there's a couple people in the chat room who are also using Genius too, so I think I'm going to pop out of here and open up room for them. But I did have a question before I go, and um, I'll just be listening to it in the chat room. And that is, uh, when you're doing these social annotations, uh, does it go beyond your classroom? Do you find that like students are connecting with other learners in other schools and other places? Um, that's one of the questions I'm hoping you'll get to. But I'm going to make room for the others right now. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's that's. Go ahead, Jeremy. You can answer that. Uh, you know, we haven't seen. Uh, you know, <clears throat> certainly there. I haven't asked a class in a kind of official capacity connecting, but certainly people like uh, students like uh, Eric Lick on Chaucer. I'm sure we're getting upvoted um, and getting different. Kinds of some of the users of our site, the Lit Genius users that aren't necessarily um, students in other classes, but are just you know rogue literary scholars. I'm, I'm um, and so she, uh, I'm sure you know they've gotten some interaction there. Um, but uh, and so students were interactions, and I, I I feel like they've you know we we haven't had any bad. Actions in that sense. I think it's really neat for students to find audiences outside of uh, their teacher and outside of their classmates. Uh, I think it's trans in terms of thinking about one's intellectual self as a reader and as a writer. Um, but I would like to do more, you know, class to class, connecting on Huck Finn, finding two teachers teaching the same text, um, you know, looking for another 19th century British poetry uh, <laughs> class for uh, Alicia's kids to connect with. Maybe some of that can happen here. Um, it certainly can happen in the educator forum on Genius. It's another, a place that uh, I hope will become as lively as this conversation, but uh, uh, not officially class to class, but something I would love to see more of. The potential for that kind of you know, congregating uh, all different kinds of classes on a text is, seems incredibly powerful. 
Well, you know, I'm going to raise an issue with that potentially. Um, and now, now and again, I'll think about it. Okay, so I have this adopt a poem assignment, and I tell my students I want them to take charge of a poem. And we are very much using the public site for this. Um, the problem with this is what happens after 15 weeks is over. The student has this investment in this for points, and they care about this, and they take over, and you get the student. Sometimes the, a student annotator isn't the best annotator of a text, right? And a thing that really worried me last year, and it, it still bothers me a little bit, honestly, is the sense that a, a sort of turfiness, right? That someone, you, you annotate a poem, you've got the take charge model, are you leaving any room for anybody else to come in? There are some very canonical poems that I can't touch online. I know I'm not going to send my students into Ozymandias because they're going to look at that poem and there's no room, right? And you know, it would be great, you know, maybe I could just copy that out, make it a classroom exercise or something, but in a weird way, it's pushing me outside the canon because I want to find something that's, ah, you know, maybe there's a few annotations on here, but it isn't encrusted thickly with layers and layers of other students in here and all these other voices. Um, what I'm noticing this year, though, is, and I, I'm telling my students to do this, is if, if you don't, there's usually plenty of room in any given annotation to dissent, to comment, to um, add something more, and I'm actually building that into my assignment to say, hey, you're not alone in this universe. Um, your annotations by themselves aren't necessarily going to last. That what's, What happens over time is you know, a, a, an accretion of comments that gets merged together, which to me is one of the fascinating aspects of genius. I think it's unevenly merged. I think, you know, some of us have editor status and we can go in and do that. Um, so, but, you know, there is this phenomenon of thickly encrusted text that's going to become increasingly an issue for us educators in the public side, I think. Yeah, if, I could, if I could maybe jump on that. Go ahead, Eric. Yeah. Yeah, um, so I, I sort of have the exact opposite problem. Uh, anyone has diversity. Yeah. annotated you. <laughs> yeah, barely anyone has annotated Chaucer, and that's what I ask my students to annotate, mm -hmm. even though he, within medieval literature he's very canonical, but not uh, mm -hmm. not a, as prominent. And so, actually, I thought on the the previous point of having your students in, interact with people outside of the classroom. Uh, I didn't do that much with having them interact with each other, but one of my students who liked the assignment especially and, and emailed me to say so said the thing she liked the best was interacting with some of Jeremy's colleagues at Genius who are, who are kind of trawling for annotations and just the idea that there would be someone outside of our class who was excited about Chaucer and this assignment, um, that was kind of a revelation to this student and I thought that was a really neat uh, thing that came out of the assignment. Just them realizing what, what is true with or without genius, but realizing it through genius that there's a larger community of people who care about these texts. So it's that sort of the view of canonicity that Elise is talking about. Yeah. So can I, can I ask a technical question? Because I thought there would, so um, if, if there's, a, if there's a, a line or a phrase that's already been annotated, you can suggest an, uh, an edit to that annotation, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Yes, is, and is that what you're talking about when you talked about replying, or is there yeah. a, or other ways to reply? And and just let me just to say that I thought my sixth and seventh graders would be shy about that, but they weren't. <laughs> they're, they're they're fine with going in and, and suggesting edits. This sucks. Um, this is terrible. Right? Yeah. Well, no, not not necessarily. No, I mean, you know, but that that they could find space for themselves by by doing that. Are, are there other ways to to have conversation go on? Well, the, <coughs> I find in my classes, a lot of times those suggestions aren't even just about improvements. It turns into just kind of a threaded discussion about right. some very nonlinear topic. Like suggestions is almost like you almost need like the suggestion reply and the you know the you know this is just a conversarial like reply um, because I'm finding it's more about oh I like that point or versus you know, I don't see as much dissent, and that's something I'm, I'm building my assignment coming up um, for my next module, and I want to delineate, no, we want to really focus on 
there's a difference between I'm wondering if I'm going to put a little tag in front, like a little hashtag, something to say this is, you know, a question prompt that I'm using in the suggestion box versus this is an actual suggested revision. Mm. Um, because I, I don't see that many suggested revisions. I see more like a nonlinear thread of discussion pop up in those suggestion boxes, at least in my classes. But we haven't been doing it that much, and I haven't, like, really laid down the law in terms of yeah, what that's what. My kids are actually using the suggestion as as part of their conversation, and it's more like, "Hey, um, have you thought about this?" So it, um, we have a we sort of had to. It's, the policy is kind of on the fly. I'm still working out that piece of it, but it's like use the suggestions to further the conver quote unquote conversation, but then leave you know like propose an edit if you think that there's something more that needs to be said in terms of that specific thing that somebody brought up. Uh but they are using the suggestion as a as a way to to really have that share their thoughts. So give us together. two buttons, Jeremy. Yeah, yeah no, actually, go. you're gonna find. Oh no, Craig, you're you're uh, prophesizing there. We are gonna be changing the interface really uh, very soon to allow for more. You know, for basically two kinds of uh, annotation to take place for genius annotations for the kind of Wikipedia like gloss. Um, but then another uh, form of annotation that's a personal annotation. So there's going to be more ability to have discussion uh, uh, inside of the annotation space about a particular line and about a particular annotation of, of a particular line. In fact, that is basically the number one design engineering uh, project at Genius right now. So you can expect there to be a more uh, obvious place for the kinds of ways that you guys have been hacking the site to have <laughs> continued class conversation <laughs> online. <laughs> and it's absolutely true that educators using the site are driving the, the product or the project and de driving de uh, engineering and design decisions. And one of those ways is that we just saw all the kids using the suggestions to have conversation, <laughs> you know, and not to always try to be Wikipedia and encyclopedic mm -hmm. with their voice and say, we need to create a space for this. This is what people want. You know, obviously, things like Twitter, other social networks also suggest that people want to talk this way online. Um, so we're going to try to bring the Twitter in while maintaining the kind of Wikipedia uh, at the same time. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's that's yeah. coming soon. Something about this is making me uneasy, Jeremy. The, we're adding a Twitter feed to the Wikipedia. Um, uh, <laughs> but what's going to happen to the quality of our annotations if it's all going to dissolve into tweets? Well, the theory, the theory is that, uh, I mean, first of all, I mean, I think, you know, whether Wikipedia or Twitter is the true digital wall of history in the 21st century seems to me like a, an interesting question. <laughs> Wikipedia clearly is more foregrounding that uh, aspect of itself as being a historical repository of knowledge, but Twitter is, of course, where everyday experiences are being recorded in a more kind of oral history um, in a more individualistic way, uh, in a more idiosyncratic way that, uh, I don't know, just seems maybe a more accurate history in some ways. Um, but also, uh, we are trying to, uh, we, we believe that the discussion, and you know this from as teachers, what is discussion good for? Discussion is good for solidifying and developing ideas and taking those ideas and later putting them into a paper that it's yeah is more like wikipedia so if class discussion is twitter and the final paper although alicia is getting rid of it just kidding yeah. uh, is is wikipedia you you would think that the twitter part of the of the annotation you know the new annotation world that's going to be on the site will be generative of you know good information good knowledge um, and uh, you know will you know will be productive in the same way uh, uh, as you know, just going straight to the wiki. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think I think you answered, Mike. I was being sort of playing devil's advocate there for a minute, but that has actually been a, a, a sort of issue for me from the beginning. Is uh oh, what am I doing in this site that's pretending to be the Wikipedia of poetry, and is it going to be authoritative, or is it just sort of what everybody thinks the poem means? And Jeremy, all along in our conversations, was always telling me it's. Yeah, basically because we educators are involved and there are really good um, editors, I think a perfect rhyme, he's often involved with my students, 
things. Um, but the editors uh, get involved, and we all have a sort of quality control role to play. It's just how we're hardwired. And there is, a, there is something about the genius environment that I think does uplift the content conversation, doesn't it? I mean, at least I hope so. Yeah. But. About um, about the conversation piece, I have a question for you guys. Is anybody using, I told my students, and this is on the class page, that they could also ask questions because they didn't feel like they, they had the knowledge or expertise to make statements necessarily, um, but that they could say, hey, I don't understand this line. Does anyone understand it? Or I'm not sure, is this what this means? And that they could reply to each other in that way. Is anybody doing anything with questions in annotations? Yeah, I, um, I didn't specifically tell my students to ask questions. Some of them did, and I thought that uh, that went very well. And often just getting to the stage of being able to ask an intelligent question about the text already shows a lot of engagement. And so, I mean, I was blown away by my students' annotations in general, but I also found myself accepting and sort of you know, uploading a lot of questions that were really good questions. Cool, yeah. Can I ask everybody a question? How are you guys, I mean, it's a little bit more difficult for me because I'm, I'm using, you know, informational text with a lot of text structure and formatting, but how are you guys formatting a text? Do you make the students do it? Um, or do you, do, you, do you just copy, like, A, I love Markdown, so I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad to just make my kids write in Markdown as much as I can just because I'm an addict. But um, very new to the drug, too. But I, I'm really <laughs> going, back to, going back a <laughs> How did the text get there on Genius? Yeah. Oh, this is something, if you let me, I'll talk a lot about this. Um, <laughs> what, we, because I, I'm imagining that most of us have editor status here, right? Mm -hmm. So that we have the power to add new text to Genius. Um, when I first started, I, I will frankly say I was appalled at some of the editions of the poems in here, and I think it's because they've been scraped from old 19th century texts that were digital, like, you know, like on Bartleby or something, and I found myself either amending texts or adding new versions of text, which got me into a little bit of trouble with the editors because Genius is supposed to have one and only one canonical version of a piece. Um, I've since been sort of playing humbly by those rules and then going and finding a text and doing things like adding a preface or fixing the spacing, um, getting into the editing mode of it. Um, I've added new texts too. Um, sometimes I've hand transcribed from a book and sometimes I've just amended what's already there. Um, it's, it's pretty easy. Easy to add texts, though I found um, there are some weird quirks with formatting, like tab spaces all being non-breaking. I don't quite get that. Um, I code in XML and work on other kinds of digital archives. This one seems kind of loosey goosey to me, but it's maybe good enough, right? Um, I yeah. But. Let's look, Jeremy. Any response yet? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, you have to uh, understand that the the lit genius poetry genius story is one that is uh, you know a, a slow moving kind of grassroots effort, and so um, you know the early poems that were added were added by people that were interested in annotating. I really, have everything by by Coleru, uh on the site, and so we. You know, we did scrape, I think, probably not Bartleby, but probably uh, Gutenberg yeah. for, for that kind of content. And we didn't have a 19th century British, you know, lit scholar with us at the time to say, this is the edition of the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Um, but I think actually in that way that that all shook out with Alicia last semester, um, you know, I'm fine with having there, there be uh, several versions as long as they're labeled as such. Same with, you know, Leaves of Grass. It's perfectly fine if there's all, you know, ten different editions. Um, in fact, it wasn't Eric, but another Chaucer professor this term uh, asked us to add some Middle English, uh, you know, the original Middle English Chaucer, where we had some modernized version. I guess Eric said it was just the spelling was modernized. It wasn't translated. But it was, you know, um, and so we added that uh, to, you know, satisfy that professor because he wanted them reading those texts. So all of these texts can exist on the site, 
uh, just as long as you know they're labeled as such. Although it's true that if there are ten versions of *Rime of the Ancient Mariner*, um, somebody searching for them might not find the best. And uh, you know, if they're really looking for the meaning of a line, the diffusion of the editorial work of students and of other users might make it hard for them to find. That gloss is also wise, but um, you know, there's room for a lot of text on on our servers. <laughs> I'm wondering if we might start bundling, um, you know, get the different editions of Leaves of Grass, or get the different Chaucers, or pull the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariners together into a kind of, you know, it, so, all right, here's one version that's been glossed, and here's another. That might be a way of dealing with things like Ozymandias, right? Like, mm -hmm. give us a clean slate so we can start over. <laughs> yeah. um, I want to invite Marissa to jump in if she'd like to, and Richard or um, Jasmine, um, any other thoughts? I actually had something about this topic. Um, good, I, Jasmine, go ahead. Yeah. Doing, um, using Genius for the first time in my comp class, um, I had a lot of students that wanted to analyze texts that were not on Genius yet. Some of them were, some of them were newer, um, and I keep actually waiting for some kind of a reprimand from the editors for putting stuff up in weird formats or something. But um, I had a, a a student do a a, um, a Supreme Court uh, the dissent from uh, Justice Sotomayor on a uh, Supreme Court ruling and. Um, and, and he sent it to me in a PDF, and I tried looking for it in uh, HTML or regular text online, and I couldn't find it, so I ended up having to copy and paste from the PDF. And in doing so, uh, there were a lot of footnotes. So on one page, there would be two footnotes, and some of those footnotes would carry over to another page, and so I found myself having to move a lot of it into Genius, and the, it, it was a very time-consuming process, and I had 38 students requesting all of these different um, texts that most of them weren't online yet, so I... And they I, can't put them up themselves. Right, and I and plus I wanted to kind of... Um, I mean, I have an interest in it, too, you know, so I wanted to I wanted to be part of that process of putting this stuff up there, and, and so I invested the time, but, you know, I... They didn't then get on there and do their annotations. You know, I'd call them out in class and everything. So, um, but it, but it was a definitely a learning process putting putting stuff up there that was not up there already. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I'll just say that I actually I believe that um, that any user can add a text. Uh, you don't have to be an editor to add a text. Um, and so, because the idea being here, if you think back to the days of Rat Genius, uh, and and uh, just as a side note, Jasmine, I, I feel your pain. Uh, I've uploaded many a PDF and done backspacing to avoid, you know, uh, to avoid the new formatting. So it's a uh, it's a shared burden of those of us trying to get certain texts up on the site. Um, was just doing that today with some scientific articles for my wife, who's a biologist who wants to, you know, do some plus one. Articles that I was transferring from PDF, very labor intensive, but ultimately worth while. <laughs> and you can dump that work on your on your students. The idea here being, you know, when Jay Z comes out with a new song, back in the days of Rap Genius, we don't want there to be anything stopping somebody from adding that song. So adding a text to Genius is very easy. We could add a transcript of this. Any one of your students could add a poem or a rap or an essay themselves. Um, to the site, uh, so it's very easy to add text. Uh, it's they're in PDF format, but it is you know, anybody can do it. Um, but uh, so so Jas so it looks Jasmine's cool students we're all doing these really awesome primary source documents. So Jasmine's students could have put those texts up themselves. Well, I I. You know, I didn't. I didn't check to see if they could or couldn't. I assumed that I had to, but now that I know that they can do it, they can have at it. <laughs> Fair enough. So, and and is there is there any problem with that? There's not, right? I mean, uh, and well, uh, no. I mean. The, the problems are, the two problems that could arise are, one, if the Sotomayor piece was already on the site, we wouldn't want a duplicate uh, unless it was some other translation that Alicia wanted to read of the Sotomayor, uh, you know, uh, response that we would want to have an alternate version. But um, 
And the other one is copyright. Uh, you know, we, we, we try to be respectful of copyright and get uh, permission when we can. Um, so we do monitor to see if something's being added that is under copyright or that if it's in violation. Um, and we are DMCA compliant when somebody does point that out to us if we didn't see it. Um, mm -hmm. Fair enough. Greg, did you, without getting too wonky, did you have a PDF solution that you wanted I, to use? I'm mm -hmm. trying. I, um, and I do, and I make sure, again, that the PDFs, like, I'm, I'm using research articles where I know, like, it was Dana Boyd's work, something that is also in Creative Commons, not just, uh, not a piece that's, you know, in a, so much formatting goes into those journal articles that you can't just copy and paste the, co the, um, the code. So, but I, I'm trying to come up with a system, and I'll share it. I'm sharing my um, trials and tribulations on the educator forums as I, as I keep trying new approaches. Basically, what I'm thinking is if I can stick a PDF into an, an adaptive reader program like Kurzweil or something that just gives me the text, then I can take that text and throw it into a markdown editor, take the markdown and put it up on Genius. I'm, I'm, it's close. I've gotten close to getting it there. It's not not working yet. So the, the only big issue is time. It works. It's just um, I'm big on if an author put a heading here, I should respect that author and keep that heading there. Same thing with the spacing and poetry. I'm trying to really hard to respect the original design decisions of the author. Greg, while you're still talking and we're running out of time, but I, I wanted you to, you said right at the beginning something about Maker and we, we mentioned um, kind of a, a not great use of images, but you're using images in interesting ways. You're yeah, I, um... I, what I had kids do is I really um, a response gift for GIF, and basically I they had to take a quote, to find a blank meme, make the meme, and then put that into uh, um, as an annotation and explain why they added that um, why that annotation best represents that that quote. Um, mainly because it's, you know, I'm, I'm teaching more than just annotation there. I'm, I'm trying to do just some um, web literacy and web maker skills there. Um, and it's just fun. I think Jeremy sent, shared an example or, of, um, it was some country song of cups, or I can't remember, <coughs> but it was, it was a perfect example of just a multimodal annotation um, with so many different, just not just, just like, oh, there's the word sun, so I'm going to go to Google Images and stick any random sun in there. But it was an awesome example of um, the full multimodal features that can be done. And I, I don't want to discourage people from doing multimodal annotations. Allow kids to and put that clip on a text as an audio response to the text or find other clips or, or, or you know, make clips so... We can we can play with images on on um, on uh, Genius, and I like it. It's fun. We're get, we're getting up to the top of the hour here. Um, Marissa, I invited you earlier, but do you want to introduce yourself here at the end and say how you've been using Genius? Um, okay, I teach high school in South Dakota, and I've actually been using it collaboratively um, with Rick, who's also in the. Good. In the group, yeah. wave high, right? <laughs> um, And I was, um, we just started using it because I learned about it at the um, SD Council of Teachers of English and um, wondered if anybody else was using it collaboratively because um, my school, like I said, is in South Dakota and Rick's is in Michigan. And our two AP classes are kind of communicating through their annotations and they're so annotating they're in like different schools or same school but two different um, classes? Different schools, different um, different schools, different, different states. states. Different states. Um, different time zones. Yeah, so yeah, so that's tricky. Um pretty awesome. really well so far. But Excuse the me? people on the West Coast would probably be replying, right? To the um, well the, the further west you are you're in the right, he's a later time zone. <laughs> I think the time zones would be good for collaboration. Yeah. yeah well, but it's asynchronous too, right? Yeah. I mean. yeah, we're not doing it at the same time, but it's nice because we can, um, they can play off each other's ideas whenever they get to their annotations and then they can 
challenge each other and um, have to defend their annotations to each other, and so. Um, we're actually looking forward to using it with. We started with Macbeth, but we're um, going to use it with ceremony in uh, our second semester. And Marissa and I have collaborated in the in the past using different platforms. And what we find, well, what I find really interesting is the way that the regionality affects the way the kids annotate and what they see. Ooh. So my kids don't have any clue as to what a reservation is. For us, it's casino, and for hers, it was something it was something different. And we were also talking about voice. Is the and Marissa could probably talk about this too. Just the way our students talked about themselves when faced with um, you know kind of the other, and it was interesting. It was seeing that happen here, but over an actual text that we're giving them. So I get, I'm asking a, a technical question also. Have you experimented with using a tag um, so that the text that the two of you are using together might appear on a page and then it would be easier to find each other, that kind of thing? Or, or do you just send each other the links to the text at this point? We, because um, we do a Google community too that they're mm -hmm. part of. <laughs> And so I just posted the link on the Google community. I really haven't played with tagging at all. We actually just started doing this last week. I one think week ago. <laughs> like just one week, and so we're still figuring it out, figuring out what the best way is. Um, we also want, um, we were just wondering also about how to connect with other teachers that we don't know, because Rick and I knew each other before, and so that's how we could collaborate that way. But um, um, just mm -hmm. like... For example, if there was another class in some other state that was doing this, or a college class that's doing ceremony or something, like, is there a way to connect with teachers easily okay. to find out who's doing what, I guess? I would use the educator forum. Yeah, I'm going to post the link to the educator forum both in the Google Hangout here um, and in the uh, uh, TTT studio chat that's going on. There's a number of things. I mean, Marissa and... Rick want to connect uh, to do some, you know, cross inter inter class across the country regional collaboration. Some people are asking about resources. I know Jennifer. I don't know if she's still with us. Wants to know if people have seen literature on social annotation and and close reading skill development. So um, you may not even start to the conversation that's going on here is amazing, and I, I hope that it can continue. There's so many different questions. Greg, somebody's asking to, to see some of your resources. So please, you know, reconnect on the, the educator forum. That's the best place uh, that I know to continue the conversation. Um, Paul, thank you so much for making this happen. It's really so good to see all these people. Uh, virtual room uh, it really is amazing. Well, it's great, and it's great that there are so many places we can keep connecting. So, the education for education forum is that right? Is the best place to do that? I think so. In terms yeah. of following up specifically on some of the stuff here, um, mm -hmm. asking me for more resources uh, to use the site, but also Greg, some people trying to connect with him. Um, people may want to, to find each other. Um, to do collaborations of various sorts and uh, use each other as resources because you guys are the leaders of this education genius movement and uh, I, again I'm, I'm sounding dopey repeating myself but it really is humbling to uh, to see you all here. <laughs> so great. Jeremy, whenever the uh, the uh, Twitter like function appears, we'll invite you back and you can explain. Great. <laughs> <laughs> or, or before that. But thank you all so much. Um, I learned a lot tonight um, and I wish we could keep going, but we need to respect each other's time a little bit here. Um, <laughs> so I do want to say that um, we, we um, have conversations like this every Wednesday. 6 p.m. Oh. Pacific time. Um, uh, we do this teachers or the EdTech Talk channel with the World Bridges Network. Um, and um, I'll, I'll send a link. I'll put, the, I'll put a link to the video up pretty quickly on the forum, and um, we can continue at another time. Thank you all for coming tonight and uh, enjoyed the conversation. Um, I should say, I always do, that uh, Dave Cormier and... Um, um, great. Um, and, and Jeff Lebo um, started that uh, that uh, EdTech talk.
uh, several years ago, many years ago. Thank you all for joining us tonight, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank Thanks, you. guys. Thank you. Good night. Nice to meet you all. You too. Likewise.